Thanks, everybody. I love you guys. I see so many familiar faces, so many people, some I haven't seen in a very long time. I'm just glad we're here together. I'm glad we can remember that what's important is us, despite our differences. Guys, in case we have, I don't know why we have to learn this lesson the hard way, generation after generation. We don't have differences. It's us versus everybody. We don't have differences. They don't see us as different. And we're fools when we see each other as different. With due respect to all of us. I speak for myself sometimes. Sometimes I'll look at someone in my own community and say, bro, this guy. What do you mean, bro, this guy? The guy's your brother. I appreciate us. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, when I think Dearborn and all the quirkiness, like all of it, all of it, like the roads and the sounds and the, and, and, and the places and the faces and... I'm so glad we have this. We are a very interesting place. Sometimes I'm amazed how sociologists haven't caught on to Dearborn, Michigan. It blows my mind. Do you realize what this is? Do you realize that most immigration to this country was optional? Most of the people who came to this country came here because they wanted a greater opportunity and they chose to come here. It was a business decision. It was like, I can make so much more money coming here. But Dearborn, Michigan, and especially since pretty much the mid-20th century on, post-World War II, a lot of us did not come here by choice. We're very grateful to be here. And I'll speak for myself at least. America gave me a home and opportunities that my place back home could never have given me. Sometimes I'm amazed by the upward mobility that I've been able to achieve, me and my family, in this country. It's incredible. We've been able to make greater gains than some of our ancestors have for hundreds of years back home. And I'm very grateful for it. But sometimes I wonder what it might have been like if, I, if we had just stayed home. It's a very interesting group. A lot of us are refugees or vagabonds. We came to build a home because our old home couldn't be our home anymore. But it's still home. We still feel it. And when we see what's happening all day, every day, everywhere, it's not one place happening over and over. We wonder what home is anymore. How do we go forward? How do we continue? I want to share with you another book. This is called a Sahifa Sajjadiya. This is a book that is attributed to one of the descendants of the Prophet Muhammad himself. And by some Muslims consider him the fourth spiritual guide or the fourth patriarch of Muslims. He witnessed an indescribable atrocity, the details of which I'm not even going to repeat. In a battle called Karbala, and he was the sole adult male survivor of a massacre. And I won't get into the details of what happened, but it's as horrific as can be imagined. And we see examples of it every day. When he got back home, you know what he did? He just told the story. With poetry. With words. He just told the story with words. He basically just kept the story going with words. And here they are. We still have them here. And in times of difficulty, in times of grief, we go back to the words. Some of the divisions that come up in our community are very simple misunderstandings. And they derive from positionalities that uh, just fail to take in a bigger picture. And sometimes we get caught up on the details. We forget that we're actually trying to say the same thing. We're just trying to say it in different ways. And some of them result from the way we tell our stories and our mythology. So before I go on, I just want to mention something. I'm going to speak about the Islamic tradition as a mythology for a second. And I want to remind you of a few things, guys. First and foremost, I'm a linguist. I'm a language scientist. Uh, I study the art and science of language, and I specialize in literature. 
And one of the things that we talk about in literature is when we look at the body of stories that tell a culture, we call that a mythology. Mythology doesn't mean it's false. It doesn't mean it's not real. It doesn't mean it's not true. It just means that even if it's true or not, those stories shape our consciousness and our identity. So the mythology of the Islamic tradition tells us what it means to be a Muslim. We have some Muslims who say that the essence of faith is in the family. It's in the father, the mother, the sons, the daughter. When those come together and when there is balance and equanimity within the home, the whole community flourishes. We call that Ahl al-Bayt. And that means, simply put, as a mythology, it is the belief that if we can fix ourselves within our homes and everybody does their job at home, the whole community will thrive. It reminds me of a teaching by an ancient Chinese philosopher called Confucius, who actually argued the same thing. He said, if you want to solve your problems, go fix them at home. And he said something like this, what's your role in the home? For example, my role in the home is I'm the big brother. I'm the oldest brother in my family. Confucius would probably say to me, since you're the big brother in the family, be the big brother in the community. What's your role in the family? Oh, I'm the father. Then be a father to your kids and you'll be a father to the community. That's his argument. And he believes that that's a solution to a community problem. I would say that some Muslims would argue the same thing. They would say, if you want to see the prime example of what a father is, look to the Ahl al-Bayt. If you want to see a prime example of what a daughter is, look to the Ahl al-Bayt. It's an example like that. It's just an example. But it's a philosophy that shapes how we live our lives. There's another opinion. Another opinion says that the mythology of the Muslim tradition is much greater than just the family. It includes the entire pantheon of all the players in the story. And some of them were very good, and some of them were very bad. But all of them were a lesson. Every single one of them was a lesson. That reminds me of the Hindus. The Hindus believe in a pantheon, and they say that we have stories of people who were the best of the world and the worst of the world, but we honor all of them because all of them set an example for the rest of us of what to do and what not to do. And we call those Muslims the Sahaba, the companions. And all of their individual stories come together to weave a mosaic of what a society should look like and shouldn't look like, and what kind of people we should watch out for and what kind of people we shouldn't watch out for. It's beautiful. It's all stories. Sahifa Sajjadiyya is a book I often come to, and it's written by, uh, as I mentioned, who is called the Imam al Sajjad or the fourth patriarch of, of Shia Muslims, however you call it. At the end of the day, I don't know how to describe this book. This actual copy uh, I found in, in one of those like um, little free libraries. You know the ones like that you, you walk around, you find in the, uh, on the shelves on the street? They have like those boxes with books in them. That's where I found this. And I so this is somebody's copy, and clearly it's been used and beaten up. It's beautiful. I never understood the philosophy of dua, as we understand it in the Islamic tradition, until I grew old enough to experience suffering. And the kind of suffering, actually, that can go so deep that no one understands. No one understands. It's when you're in so much pain you think you're alone. Being alone is an, is an illusion. Dua reminds you that you're not alone. There are things in this book, you know, there's a confession in this book where the Imam says something absolutely fascinating. He's having a conversation with his soul. He's saying the things to himself that all of us say when we're alone and nobody's watching. You know what I'm talking about? You ever been alone when no one's watching and you start to talk and the truth comes out and you can be honest with yourself for once? He wrote it down. And it's a very, very simple idea. The idea is, depending on which of the du'as you read, the idea is only when I'm alone can I be really honest with myself. But the funny thing is, when you're alone and honest with yourself, that's when you are the closest to everyone around you. Because we all feel those things. We all think those things. We're all in that experience together and sharing that experience together. But we forget. 
And that's why it's important to come together and share words and share stories. That's the most important thing about us being here. Hayyan Sharara is an Arab American poet. And he wrote a poem called Apokalyptin, which is Arabic for apocalypse. I want to read it to you. It's not a short one. It's a heavy one. But it's a very good example, I think, of how the experience is universal. This is a poem that's not about what's going on right at this moment today. But it's a universal experience that all of us share. I want to read it to you. As I read this uh, poem, Apocalyptine by Hayyan Sharara, remember that like all poetry, we bring our personal experience to it. And one of the reasons I'm bringing words and language to us today, one of the main reasons, is it helps me process. It helps me grieve. And I found that for a lot of us, art in all of its expressive forms helps us grieve and helps us process. And that's the main reason. So here's what I want you to do. For the last few days, we have experienced such an influx of pain and agony and confusion and frustration and we need to channel it. And I think this poem will be one of the ways that we can channel it together. So just bring all that to the surface and let's go through it together. This is Apocalyptin. The Arab apocalypse began around the year of my birth, give or take. The human apocalypse a few thousand years earlier. I earn my living teaching about the human condition, a composite of violence, vengeance, and theft, ingenuity too, and forms of love unique to men and women, the only species that knows consciously what others of its kind thought and did thousands of years before. Stories, myths, histories, philosophies, all mirrors and constellations showing humanity to itself, none of which will ensure our survival. Before I go on, I want to point out something about poems. Every section has a punchline. There's a part where it's supposed to hit you. So just listen for these. They're very beautiful. A mile, a mile and a half from the border, the Israeli border, Bintish Bail, the small city my father left in 1967, its orchards, hillsides, rivers, roads, highways, bridges, houses, schools, restaurants, coffee shops, pharmacies, hospitals, cemeteries, twice in his lifetime, obliterated. The Arab apocalypse began in the 1950s and 60s in Egypt, Tunisia, Libya, Syria, and Iraq. The human apocalypse in 1945 in a desert in New Mexico where scientists exploded the first atomic bomb. In Beirut, snipers picked off children sneaking to buy candy, candy, yet the population grew. In 1972, my father paid $9,000 for a house in Detroit. Forty years later, a foreclosure, it sold for $8,000. Its windows, doors, floors, walls, the porch, the mailbox, the tree in front, birch or poplar, gone. Now, weeds and bushes block the drive. Vines where the chimney once was creep over the rooftop. In free fall, an expert in urban decline describes Detroit's population. At the current rate, by the beginning of the next century, stray dogs will outnumber people. Soon as I earned enough to get out, I got out. Still a street comes to mind. Forest, Grand, St. Aubin. Lafayette, or the bridge over the river to Belle Isle, or the tunnel lights before Joe Louis Arena, or disappearing in a rearview mirror, the horizon with smokestacks, which once upon a time I believed no other on earth could match in perfection. The Arab apocalypse began on a piece of paper in 1917. The human apocalypse 50,000 years ago when hunters wiped out the giant kangaroo. 
In politics, practically nothing is new. 2,400 years ago, Plato worried about the speech acts, what he called craft. The crowd swayed so easily by emotion and flattery, interest and advantage, the logical failures to follow. Today, which poems will cause institutions to fail? Who worries about that? The city was here when lust lured us away from the animals, when kings and children of gods hunted side by side in the forests of lesser gods, when Priam begged for his boy's broken body, when Achilles, cruel and beautiful, chose death for glory, when Abram became Abraham and Muhammad heard God's voice in a lightning bolt, it was here, and the asphalt and concrete won't reveal what it was, the rivers won't either, or the trees or the soot, turning factory walls and lungs permanently black, whatever it was, swamp, forest, glacier, it was there. The apocalypse began with a thousand hoofbeats across a field, men hollering, women wondering where to hide the children. Here, a mother said, we will hide in the earth. Our ancestors are already there. The rest will follow. How are we going to tell our story? I've said this to my students in the past, I've said it to my friends, I've said it to my family, I've said it to my community, I'm gonna repeat it. I believe that the 21st century Harlem Renaissance is going to happen here in the 313. I believe we are the next cultural revolution in this country. And I'm gonna tell you why. Because we are the sons of this country and the daughters of this country and we are the sons of daughters of the old country. And we have two beautiful, powerful cultures that we can bring together. And how are we going to do it? We're going to do it through the arts. I want to talk about art. What is art? Is it a painting in the museum? No, that's not art. That's an artifact. That's when art is finished. We try to remember it and hang it up there. Art is very dynamic. Art is immediate. Art is war. Art is conflict. Art is intelligent warfare. As they try to tell us who we are, we show them who we are. We do it with words. We do it with paint. We do it with dance. We do it with music. We do it with fashion. We do it with design. We do it with architecture. We do it with silverware. We do it with jewelry. We tell our story. Nobody is going to tell our story. I'm tired of how comfortable people feel telling us who we are. When I was growing up, they told me I was responsible for the greatest atrocity in our country here in the United States. And there was a part of me that fell for it and believed them. And I had a real identity crisis. I had to decide, they made me feel, if I was this or that. They wouldn't let me be both. In a beautiful speech at the uh, Oxford Union, James Baldwin describes the trauma of a little black child, an African-American child, who would watch TV and watch John Wayne kill the Indians. And then, when that kid would look in the mirror, they would realize that the Indians is them. They're rooting for killing the Indians, but then they realize, no, you're the Indians. It's that spirit, it's exactly that moment I told you, back in 2001, when I thought to myself, what did they do to our country? And the country pointed at me and said, yeah, what did you do to our country? We will decide our narrative. I called upon so many people to come out here today. And I had a lot of people say they could make it and some people say they couldn't make it. Uh, and there are people who had other commitments because so much is going on. I'm very happy, I'm very, very happy 
that we have been activated and ignited, I think, from a position of survival at this point, to come together and try to find a solution forward. And I think the solution is art. I think one of the reasons this stage is so important and why I want to defend the right of the stage forever and I want to continue to keep the stage alive is because this is where we tell our stories. It's our job. We have generations coming and going and continuing to come in. We are going to have future generations who want to know what the heck happened here. And we want to be able to tell them. We want to be able to show them. I wasn't surprised when through all the things I saw this week, it was a simple work of art that moved me to tears. That didn't surprise me. It inspired me. It made me realize that we have a much greater message as a community and we have to tell it. And it's going to be born from a lot of things. From our pain, from our anger, from our frustration, but most of all from our hope. Because when we create the art of the next generation, our hope is that we will be able to help them tell their story. And we keep passing it on. And I want to continue to do that. I don't want the stage to die. This is not a place for entertainment. Sometimes it is entertaining. But what really is the point of art is to help us move through the human condition together. Guys, we're a family. We forget it sometimes. Families bicker between one another. But the 313 is our home, and it's our story, and we've got to tell it together. And to do that, we've got to set aside our perceived differences. And I want to tell you why they're perceived differences. Because we found out very, very clearly this week, and continue to be reminded over and over, that our enemies don't see us as different at all. They put us all in one big pile. Piles. Piles. We're piles to them. We have a responsibility for ourselves, for our kids, for our families, for our children. I do not want to see what happened to my generation and my friends in the post 9-11 era happen to this next generation. I do not want you to be lost in despair. I want you to know that there's an answer. And the answer is that we need to come from a positionality, not of despair, but of hope. And what's the hope? The hope is, this time around, we're going to tell you who we are. And we're going to show it to you through art. We're going to show it to you through music. We're going to show it to you through dance. We're going to show it to you through words, poetry, short stories, novels, plays. What's the purpose? The purpose is we have to tell our story. We are each the griot. We are the griots. I brought my typewriter, one of them. I still write on one of these things. And you might think I'm crazy, but I think these things are magic. The first typewriter I bought was in Dearborn. It was at Village Antiques on Michigan Avenue. I bought it for $27. I named him Earl. And I bought him during what was probably the darkest time in my life. And I had him sitting up in my room. And every time I got mad, I'd go and beat the crap out of him. Just ta 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 just the whole thing right on. I didn't even know what I was writing until the next morning. I'd go up and read what I wrote. I'd be like, I said that? <laughs> writers, writers, beware what you do. Everything you write comes true. So I write on him. I brought him into my classroom sometime last year, and I'll be taking him back. I just put him on a table and saw what happened. Some kids fidgeted with it. And then there was one student who sat down at the table and he just started writing. And he didn't stop for hours. And then he left and he came back and he didn't stop for days. I couldn't even stop him during class. We just had to listen to the typewriter going on in the back. He didn't say a word. He just put it all on paper. What's your medium? What's your tool? What's your way of telling your story? And how will you share it? Guys, we're all artists. We're all artists. We all have an imagination. I'm going to wrap up with this in just a moment. We all have an imagination. I want to talk a little bit about imagination for just one second. Imagination is all we have. It is the ability to see things other than what they are. But unfortunately, we 
were robbed of our imagination and we were told to suppress it. I want to tell you a little story and this is a story many of us are probably very familiar with. Once upon a time there was a little kid who used to color at home. She had a box of crayons and a paper and she would just color. She'd color her house and she'd color the sky and she'd color the grass and she'd color the trees and everything was a different color. And it didn't matter, one day she'd just come up and grab a crayon and just color. So she went to school and at school they said everybody draw a picture of your house. So she started coloring her house, coloring the trees, coloring the bushes, coloring the roof, and then she grabbed a purple crayon and she colored the sky. And the teacher said, no, you can't do that. Skies are not purple, skies are blue, fix it. So she said, okay, and she fixed it. She went back home, came back the next day. All right, let's do it again. Now let's color a picture of a field. All right, great, grab some picture, grab some uh, green, uh, Crayons and color a green, color a tree, color some birds. And then she grabbed a crayon and she colored the sky black. And the teacher said, no, skies are not black. Skies are blue. Fix it. And if you do it again, I will punish you. You're wrong. Damn. The third time she colored the sky green, she got punished. And from that point on, she learned that the sky is blue and that's all there is to it. And she never dared see the sky any other way. There's just one problem. The child is right. Sometimes skies are purple. Sometimes skies are black. And sometimes skies are green. And sometimes they're red. And sometimes they're yellow. Skies are all different colors. We all have that story. I'll tell you mine. When I was growing up, I used to watch a film with my dad called The Jungle Book, Walt Disney film, 1960s. It's a beautiful story about this little boy and he has all these little jungle friends and he lives in the jungle and there's a tiger and there's a panther and I love that story. And I just loved imagining myself in the jungle. One time when I was very little, my parents, well my mom, she got together with her friends and took all the kids and we went to Ford Field Park, right there, still there on Ford and uh, Greenfield. And when I got there, uh, I was very excited because I was at the park and I just imagined that it was the jungle from the Jungle Book and I was Mowgli. And I just started jumping around, I played in the grass, I grabbed sticks off the trees, I climbed on the jungle gym and I was having so much fun. And then on our way out, I remember we were leaving the park, we were walking back and I remember saying out loud, I had so much fun in the jungle today. There was a boy who was maybe a year older than me and he replied to what I said. And with as much frustration and anger and rage as he could muster, he said to me, it's a park. It's a park. That was the day I lost my imagination. But let's be honest, you guys know Yusuf, you know word man, I did not lose my imagination. <laughs> Can't take my imagination from me. <laughs> Imagination is all we got. We have to dare to imagine. We have to dare to imagine and see the world not as, it, not as it is, but as it could be. And how do we do that? We do that through art. I want to call on everybody to do two things. Collective imagination is the most powerful thing we have. I want to schedule something for tomorrow at 7 p.m. Tomorrow at 7 p.m., all of us. I want us to imagine the world not as it is, but as it could be. And I want us to record it in some way. Play it on the piano, strum it on a guitar, draw it on a piece of paper, splatter it with paint, smash it into a typewriter, scribble it onto a page, recite it from a great poem, dance it into the night, whatever you do. Show the world who we are.